8th of February. And uh, the purpose of this meeting, as you all know, is to set our rate. So the first thing I want to do is to take any apologies. I have apologies from Roisin. Any others? John? Uh, alongside Roisin, Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, Pordy Kelly, and Catherine Kelly. Glenn Campbell is running late for you to get here. And just on that, a lot of our councillors aren't being able to get here because of adverse weather conditions. So after we've set the rate and stuff, we may want to come back to that and have a slight discussion on how that could change going forward if, if the chair agrees. Well, why do we take it tonight or we take it through the relevant committee, John? Uh, well, it, we, we mentioned mention it tonight, so we'll be ready for the relevant committee coming up. Uh, Is that okay? Okay. All right. Uh, Paul? Councillor Hawks and Councillor Mabel. Thank you. Victor? We have two guys running late, but they're supposed to be both here. Okay. Thank you. And other, any other apologies? No. Okay. Have we any declarations of interest? No, no declarations of interest. Okay, so uh, before I ask Jill to take our first paper on, on the order of business this evening, I just want to, I suppose, set a little bit of the, of the context. We are here, as I said, to strike the rate. And uh, it isn't just about coming in here tonight to, to listen to the reports and to strike a rate. We have all had that opportunity over the last three months or so to engage with officers, uh, both uh, in the workshops and as party groupings and individuals to feed in and to have our say on what we see as important within our various uh, communities and districts to uh, make sure that we can deliver throughout the coming years. So it is on on that basis that we are arriving to tonight, uh, having done that due diligence work to be able to arrive at the papers and hopefully, uh, while probably not everything that people would want to see uh, being able to be delivered, there is the vast majority of what uh, we can deliver within the uh, confines of being able to strike a reasonable rate and to be able to uh, be very conscious of the cost of living uh, crisis that is still gripping our community and from Ananoma and elsewhere, and to be uh, very conscious that that is still a major uh, struggle for people individually uh, as citizens and also for our business sector as well. And not forgetting, of course, that we strike less than half of what the uh, rate eventually will be, that the other half is done central government, and that is 51% to central government. So uh, local government gets the short end of the stick on the, on the overall rate uh, that was eventually set. So that being said, I'll ask Jill to take the first paper. Chair, thank you. Um, members, good evening. Um, so there's a number of papers this evening. So the first paper I'm going to cover is the overall estimates of income and expenditure for 24, 25, um, effectively the budget for the council um, for next year in terms of what, what we want to do going forward. And that's for your consideration and decision this evening. Um, at the outset, I want to thank members for your engagement in the process um, so far. Um, work has been going on for a number of months um, through the formal workshops, informally, through meetings with the various parties and other engagements. And members have been very keen and absolutely very informed about the process, and that's important and very much appreciated. Um, I also want to thank, thank at the outset the team um, and the finance team for their work on the process. Um, they have been very diligent um, and very meticulous in the care and intention to their work. Um, Catherine and Kathleen and Patricia and the wider team and also the other directors and the service teams for their input into 
um, line by line input in, into the estimates and the budgets that have brought us here this evening. So in terms of um, the process, as members will be aware, um, the estimates process is laid down in legislation through the Local Government Finance Act, and there is a requirement that we prepare and approve estimates and strike a district rate by the 15th of February 2024. In terms of how we got to this stage, as you'll be aware, we've had two formal workshops with elected members um, where we've considered in detail the income and the expenditure required to fund the services, um, the capital plan, the proposed capital plan for this year in its entirety and the funding associated with that, the reserves that the Council holds, the position regarding central government funding, the rate space um, where we derive our income and in all those aspects we've considered the risks in each of those areas as I've scrutinised, the uncertainties and, and ran through the assumptions. Um, so in terms of the reports here this evening, so the overall report um, gives a, a detailed uh, overview of the income and expenditure and there are two appendices to it. Appendices 1, 1A is the proposed budget itself on one page. That takes you through the proposed budget across all the service areas, compares with the budget we had in place at this time last year, identifies the variance and the change quite clearly. And it also outlines the position in terms of reserves transfers, the position in terms of the financing of our capital expenditure, the grants that we get from central government, working down to the, the total amount of funding that we need to generate from the rate space and what that translates into the actual rate. So if I briefly, at summary level, run through the main points of this so you, you, you get um, a, a, a sense of, of how it has all come together. So if we look um, at the paper uh, appendix one on our report, so the objectives of the rate process are that we set a budget for the council to support our aims and objectives. Our long-term aims objectives as outlined for the district as outlined in the community plan and also in our own council corporate plan. You will be aware we have a new corporate plan which is currently out for consultation and this budget will, will fund the actions and the objectives of that plan. And the objectives of the process is to help um, the council elected members determine the priorities for our spend, for our service spend and our capital spend and the timing of that. In terms of uh, the overall budget, um, for 24-25 uh, we are proposing an overall budget of 44.3 million which is to be funded for, um, through the rate space. Um, so this represents an uplift from last year of 2.2% um, and includes a number of different aspects, including an additional £315,000 of funding for community support and strategic growth in the district. So that's support for things like economic development, tourism development, capital grants, events and sporting bodies. In arriving in this figure, the key considerations that we looked at the community planning and the strategic plans, the key requirements across each service area at, and each functional area at a, a detailed level in terms to, of delivering the actual costs, any changes in costs, the rates and the levels of usage. We've considered the impact and, and built into the estimates of cost increases as a result of inflation, which is quite significant, as members will be aware at, at this current time, inflationary pressures are significant. Um, we have built into the budget, and there is positive news in this uh, front, um, estimates of council income, which have increased over the last year, and we've, we're projecting that those will increase um, in 24-25 through delivery of services, and the detail of that is included in the paper. We've built in um, consideration of employee costs and assumptions based around future pay awards. As members will be aware, um, staffing costs are the most significant cost within council services. We've taken account of the rate space and changes within that, the funding available from central government, and also, and importantly that, that I will touch on, the use of a portion of our COVID reserve in terms of building that into the budget. 
So if we work through um, on page four of appendix um, one, um, there's a detailed consideration of the salary and wages costs and our assumptions around those. So within our overall budget, the salary and wages costs are 32.7 million pounds, um, which represents 77% of our overall net budget. And we have a working assumption of a 4% increase in salary and wages costs for 24-25. That also includes an allowance for increased pensionary costs and pension liabilities. In terms of our operating costs, the estimates include operating costs of £18.9 million. Pounds. Um, some of the larger aspects within this are an additional 0.5, half a million pounds in relation to landfill costs um, and waste management. And the levels of waste, as members will be aware, continue to fluctuate and will impact the final costs, the final outturn that we see at the end of the year. Including also in those operational costs is the additional £315,000 for community support and strategic growth, um, an additional contribution of £115,000 for the mid Southwest growth deal, additional contributions for insurance costs, which are significant, as members will be aware, um, costs of, of insurance for all across the council state for vehicles and for public liability insurance have, have increased substantially. So that's built into those operational costs. And the third aspect um, on the overall budget is the utility costs. Um, the estimates for those for 24-25 is 2.8 million pounds. And that is a reduction um, of 800,000 pounds from our estimates last year. So last year, members will recall in terms of the volatility in, in energy prices was very significant. We had um, direct intervention from central government at a household level um, because the volatility was, volatility was so high. Um, it, things have stabilised somewhat, although utility costs still are very volatile. But there are reductions in there that we're projecting um, of around £800,000 of, of fuel, electricity, heating costs and other costs. So that's an overall sense of the breakdown of the costs. In terms of then the income portion of the budget, um, the income we are projecting will increase from last year 10.4 million to this year 11.5 million, which is an increase of 1.1 million. So we have income from council services across a wide range of areas, leisure centres, arts and tourism facilities, our theatres, marble arch caves, planning and building control, licensing. Income has increased this year um, through the work of officers in the council, and the assumption is that some of that growth will continue and increase will increase. So if we go to page six, and the table on page 2.6 summarizes the position overall in terms of those three main operational areas and gives you a comparison against the budget and the estimates from 23-24. The next section takes you through a breakdown of the budget across each of the operational service areas. And I don't propose to go through the detail of that. It's, it's, the overall budget remains the same, but it gives you a sense of how the budget is broken down across each of the different areas. So that's the overall op, um, budget, operational budget. If then we want to take a little look at the detail around the capital budget and our capital plan for 24-25. And Appendix 1B gives you the projections for the capital plan for this year. So the overall capital plan proposes a total expenditure of 13.75 million. And that's subject to significant external funding grant income of 6.4 million, 4 million pounds and other funding arrangements, including the use of council reserves. So some of the key projects within the capital plan includes 7.8 million pounds for the Fermanagh Lectland Forum. And we, this is based on the understanding that a decision is yet to be made on the full business case for the Fermanagh Lectland Forum. And it's important to note that. There is significant external funding um, against that 7.8 million pounds. And key component of the larger LUF funding of £20 million pounds for that project. Other significant capital projects include investments in uh, energy, 
um, infrastructure retrofitting and upgrades, um, investments in new vehicles and plants, um, ICT infrastructure investment, development work at waste facilities, and other strategic capital projects across the district. It also includes an investment of £400,000 um, as part of the Council's Play Park strategy um, across the district. There are details of how the capital plan is to be financed, and those are summarised in, in Appendix 1B. Uh, 1A, 1B sorry, apologies. Um, through um, the grant aid, through um, the reserves and funding transfers from those, and also through a, a portion £700,000 directly through the estimates which you have here this evening. Section 3.2 underlines the minimum revenue provision, uh, provision, and Catherine will cover this in more detail in terms of um, the proportion of funding that we need to set aside in the estimates to cover the borrowing associated with our capital projects. So you can see that shown in Appendix 1A in terms of the minimum revenue uh, provision, which is £1.3 million. Um, funding for a capital expenditure of £700,000 and also an additional £400,000, which we propose to transfer for use in the longer term capital reserve. On page 9, section 4 details our plans for the, the use of reserves in 24-25 and the Chief Executive um, in her update will give an overview of the adequacy of the, adequacy of the reserves um, in order to ensure prudence within the Council and fin financial stability in the, in the Council to ensure that um, I suppose the future capital picture is robust and stable. The Council has specified um, usable reserves and unusable um, reserves for both capital and revenue purposes and you can see the transfers of reserves outlined in Appendix 1A. E, so the overall net position for reserves transfers is £50,000. Um, so there is a transfer to reserves um, of £1.05 um, million pounds to the capital reserves for both um, repairs and renewals and also to the capital fund. So it's important that we um, invest some of, some of our money in the long term to ensure that we maintain our estate um, through that renewal and repairs fund. It also includes, and this is important for members to note, a transfer from the COVID contingency reserve of £1 million. Um, and page 10 outlines the position with regarding the COVID contingency reserve. That was a fund set up um, as part of, of our COVID recovery to ensure that we would effectively smooth the significant fluctuations that we're seeing as a result of the, the medium to longer imp economic impacts of the COVID pandemic. And we're certainly seeing those in terms of salary increases, inflationary increases. We're proposing to transfer one million pounds of the COVID reserve into the main estimates. Um, and really, that's necessary to ensure a balanced budget for this year. But the implications for that is that we really need to do a lot of work in the forthcoming year to ensure we achieve budget savings as that, that smoothing effect of that COVID funding will no longer be there. If we move then um, towards uh, other support um, and other aspects of the proposed budget, so central government support, so there are a number of um, grants and supports that we receive from central government and the details of those are highlighted. Um, so the total central government support is estimated to be around £3.57 million. Pounds. So it really is very significant support in terms of the estimates process. Um, the detailed breakdown is there. Um, Section 5.1 outlines the rate support grant um, and that we have um, a provision in the estimates of £400,000 for the rate support grant. It's important to note that that rate support grant has been decreasing over the past number of years. Very significantly this year, there was a decrease of 45% on the rate support grant. Um, that's an important, very important um, source of income for our council. It was set up to support councils where the rate pace was lower, councils like ourselves in rural areas where we still needed to deliver the same level of service as other councils, but our rate base was lower. Um, so 
the assumption is that it is £400,000, but really um, that's an estimate assumption. Um, hopefully with the return of the Assembly there will be more um, confirmation around that and more support, um, but it's, it's an uncertainty that we've built into um, the, the funding. We also have the derating grant, um, which is um, comes from central government or whatever, in terms of um, reductions that are Yes, reductions that, that have been applied to um, the rate space uh, for for payments, and that's the central government portion of that to, to align that through. So we have a, an allowance for that. And the transferred function grants, which has been in place for a number of years. Finding members, as we move um, towards bringing the estimates together and, and bringing the proposed budgets together, we have an overview of the estimated penny product, um, the value of the rate space, and our assumptions for 24 25 is this is that this will be at a similar level um, as we've had for this year it is an estimate it is an assumption but that is our working assumption based on our detailed engagement um, with land and property services in terms of their assessment of the rate space at this stage so that brings us down to the finalization um, so you can see as you work through appendix 1a work through um, how the budget is put together, um, we um, arrive at an overall estimated figure, which is the amount to be raised from the rate space of 43.15 um, million pounds. And then we work through how that aligns with the estimated penny product and, and work through the workings of that so that we have then the calculation of the proposed rates and an indication of how that relates to previous years. Um, so on page 14, um, there's an overview of the impact of the rate space um, that will have an estimate that that will have on um, domestic properties and capital properties um, within the region and non-domestic properties within the region um, in terms of, of the impact of that. So that, members, is an overall summary in terms of where we are. I suppose by way of overall position, um, there is continued financial instability in terms of external market conditions. Costs to the Council continue to rise, inflationary costs, and there also remains uncertainty around central government budgets. Um, so overall, there is our assessment is and our recommendation is that there is a continued need for, for prudence within the budgets for us to take a cautious approach due to this uncertainty. Um, and certainly with an eye to, to our future plans for the council that, that we need to have a very robust estimates for this year to account for that. So that is the summary um, of the estimates position. And the recommendation is that, that we would note that at this stage as we work our way through the other papers that, that are to be presented. OK, thank you very much, Jill. Have we any uh, thoughts or comments there? If haven't, uh, could I have a proposal in a second to note that paper as Josephine's proposing? Stephen. Yeah, happy to happy to second that chair. I suppose a couple of positives you can see we can see through this report, I suppose primarily that three hundred sorry Steve, can you just come to the microphone? Yeah, sorry, Chair. How's that for you? Good. Uh, I suppose some of the some of the positives, Chair, I suppose in that report is a uh, three hundred and fifteen thousand pounds of an additional support to communities out there and and uh, of course the extra hundred and fifteen thousand. I see there for the mid south west growth deal so there's you know there's positives in this report and just commend jill and her team for for the time and effort and the information provided so happy to second that chair okay thank you josephine did you want to just i mean they are uh yes thank you uh, well i did want to uh, thank jill and her team for preparing a very comprehensive report and for presenting it in such uh, a coherent manner which enables us to understand fully the decisions that we're about to take. Um, and I too welcome uh, the additional investment for community support and economic growth. 
uh, which I think will be of great benefit to our community. So happy to propose uh, the noting of this report, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are we all agreed, members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. And we're going to move on to Paper B now, and Catherine's going to take us through this. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, just to complicate things, so we have the Paper B with an Appendix 1, with a suite of appendices attached to Appendix 1. So I won't bring you through every single one, but I will give you an overview of these. Um, so really, as Jill had mentioned, um, and I just really want to uh, just note again the um, legislation um, behind which the reports are brought to yourselves tonight, um, and that the key the key piece there is a Local Government Finance Act, NI 2011, um, which has been in place now for a number of years. And throughout that period, um, SIPFA, um, an accountancy um, body, has produced a suite of codes um, technical enough in nature, but um, very, very easy to work through in terms of the Council's Treasury position and its borrowing position linked to a capital plan. Um, so those codes have been in place and have been updated and revised over the years. So it's on those bases um, that we present the reports within the medium term financial plan for yourselves um, this evening. Um, and just noting that the medium term financial plan members sets out the clear governance procedures um, for setting a capital strategy and a suite of potential indicators, and it's done in the same process which we are doing tonight as setting the budget for 24-25. Um, the objectives of the codes um, do allow um, the insurance that there's a clear framework for decision-making around capital expenditure plans and investment proposals, that plans are affordable, that they're proportionate, and that all external borrowing is prudent and at sustainable levels and the Treasury management decisions are taken in accordance with good professional practice. So the capital plans and the medium term itself is looked at in the light of the overall council organisational strategy. Um, and that's to ensure the decisions that are made are made with sufficient regard to the long-term financial implications and any potential risks emerging for the council. And the codes highlight that effective financial planning, including options appraisals, risk management and governance processes are essential in achieving a prudential code to our prudential approach to capital expenditure, level of investment and the level of council debt. So in terms of, of the medium term financial plan itself, members, it looks back, it looks in the current period and it looks forward. So it looks at the 23-24 updated capital plan and that's details in table one. And the current plan is estimated to be in the region of 11.7 million. That may change as we approach the 31st of March due to timing um, and under other factors and business case development. The capital plan for 24-25 is detailed in Table 2. And uh, I think Jill mentioned as well, it is subject to confirmation, um, not only of approved business cases through relevant committees, but also of future long-term funding arrangements um, and the, the completion as well of, of relevant corporate strategies and plans. The overall level of investment members uh, for the period 25 to 29, so just going to look at that's a forecast period, um, which is 118 million and will require substantial financial support in the future. And as a priority, the Council will continue to pursue external funding opportunities. So what we have at the moment is, is estimated potential future funding for future capital plans. Um, and I suppose one of the key areas that is constantly reviewed is to achieve where we can further external opportunities for funding. Therefore, it protects the need to use council resources and then further than the need to actually borrow um, in advance of need. The overall programme um, taken into account the 24-25 position is 144 million over the five years. So by no means a small project. And um, each element of that project needs to be considered in terms of its own affordability. But overall, tonight, members, we look at a medium term financial plan, what resources the Council have available and what estimated resources are in the future, together with having um, a review of the capital plan linked to the income and expenditure revenue forecasts and plans. So the long term affordability members, yeah, it's just important to note, will have an impact on future rates. So as we progress with the capital plan and when reserves are fully utilised, there is a need to either A, internally borrow and then externally borrow. And the external borrowings 
will require repayment and therefore a charge onto the revenue budgets. Appendix 1A members, and Jill referred to this, is an actual policy statement around minimum revenue provision. And in simple terms, um, that statement has been um, generated uh, in compliance with regulations, and it is an allowance within the budget for the repayment of the cost of financing the capital plan. Uh, so the figure of 1.3 million that uh, Jill referred to is the cost of repaying the council's existing borrowing. Noting members, the existing borrowing, there has been no borrowing within this council um, since its inception, um, and the borrowing um, will reduce that. that you, I think that figure was about 1.62 years ago, so it will come down. But as we advance and move into potentially a borrowing position, that figure then will come up, and th those are detailed within the prudential indicators, which is um, one of the appendices tonight. A very important uh, statement, members, is the Treasury Management Strategy Statement. And it clearly sets out expected investment and borrowing strategies for the Council. It's linked to the corporate plan, the community plan, and any capital plan um, decisions uh, in the future. And it's undertaken in compliance with another code um, issued by CIFA, which is the Treasury Management Code. It does include um, elements of forecasts right up until the 31st of March 2029. It includes a term called capital financing requirement, which is an understanding of when the council will need to actually borrow externally for capital investment decisions. It considers council reserves. It con considers treasury investment. It looks at the net interest position. So members will note we're currently generating more investment income than what we're paying out in loan repayment interest, um, but that will move to the alternative um, as we go into an external borrowing position. It also, um, very importantly, members, sets the scene. It's supported by the Council's Treasury Management Advisors. It sets out approved counterparties and specified investments in which the Council's investments are actually um, deposited with. It includes limits and periods of investments, how the credit rating of those institutions are used, and the governance and reporting arrangements. And members may be familiar with uh, the quarterly reporting that uh, we do ourselves through the Policy and Resources Committee on the Treasury Management Statement and particularly on the next um, report, which is around the Prudential Indicators. That's brought on a quarterly basis. The Council's position, members, is to maintain um, borrowing below its underlying requirements, i.e. the Council will not borrow until it needs to borrow um, and it will not borrow simply for the interest of investment. Uh, within the appendices, members, we will note that uh, not until at least 26, 27 um, is the earliest point that we have currently forecast where we would externally borrow. Um, and that, 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 that is good. Um, there, there is sufficient resources um, currently available within the Council's investments, so those investments will be utilised first um, before uh, we proceed with any external borrowing. Both the CIFPA code members and the Department for Communities Guidance require the Council to invest its Treasury funds prudently and have regard, first of all, to security, then liquidity, and only then yield. Um, so we'll, you will note on the returns where you know the yield may not, in all cases, be to its maximum that's available out there in the markets. And current market rates members are in excess of the Bank of England um, at current interest rate of 5.25%. We do try to maximise those. And the, I think the highest level of borrowing or investments on those is, is placing with other local authorities. We are achieving um, rates of 5.5%, which, which, is, which is plaudible. Appendix 1C members is a suite of what's called prudential and treasury indicators. And they are a number of calculated statistics in relation to how the borrowing and how the investments look in relation to the proposed capital plans over the periods 23, 24 to 28, 29. And as I say, they're technical in nature, but members, again, reminder that the quarterly reports on those are presented each, each, each quarter through to the Council. And we, we do come back and indicate whether we're within those limits or without those limits or whether there's any issues with those. The indicators are designed to support and record decision-making in a manner that is publicly accountable, and they are not designed to be comparative um, indicators with, with any other Council. So it's really contained within the Council's own aspirations of its Treasury management policy and its um, bar borrowing policy. 
Members, just note that at currently the capital financing requirement or the underlying need to borrow of this council is 6.1 million, but we don't need to borrow as yet. And that the current borrowing limit, um, authorised borrowing limit to be set tonight is recommended at 3.6 million. And that's just really taken into account of the current external borrowing and leaving a bit of leverage room there um, in case, just in the case that there's borrowing required. The indicators proposed members that 100% of the council debt remains at fixed interest rates. A fairly um, significant uh, appendix members is the capital strategy report. Um, and again, it's a requirement for the potential code to have a capital strategy report in place. And this strategy demonstrates that the council takes capital expenditure and investment decisions in line with service objectives and properly takes account of stewardship, value for money, prudence, sustainability and affordability. Um, it's recognised that in making this capital investment decisions, the Council must have explicit regard to options appraisals and risks to proper asset management planning for strategic planning and the achievability of future plans of the Council. It gives a high level overview members of how capital expenditure, capital financing and treasury management activity contributes to the board's provision of Council services, along with how the associated risk is managed and importantly, looking at the implications for future financial sustainability of the Council. So the purpose of the strategy is to firmly place decisions around borrowing in the context of the overall financial position of the Council and to provide improved and better linkages between the Council's revenue budget and the Council's capital budget. Mm -hmm. Decisions made in this year members on capital and strategy management will have financial consequences for the Council for future years, albeit uh, referring to that there is no requirement to borrow this year uh, so therefore there is no cost in addition in, in the future years at this point. Um, just to highlight that, um, as members are aware, with, with the proposed capital plan of 144 million, it will involve borrowing in the future. Um, that borrowing levels are based on estimates of interest rates and on council decisions that are yet to be taken on a number of significant proposed schemes, along with the future funding of the council's rate base, central government funding, and any external funding for significant projects. However, members, as Head of Finance, I am satisfied that the proposed capital programme is prudent, affordable and sustainable. And I note that some of the projects within the capital plan are dependent on future consideration of full business cases by the Council. There is also a requirement, members, um, to focus on the Council's estate strategy to ensure the efficient, effective use and sustainable use of the Council estate and members to dispose of any identified surplus assets that are not required. In addition, members, there is a need for continued review of all revenue budgets to ensure they're supported by approved council strategy and policy, and that they are efficiently and effectively aligned to the council's community and corporate plan. The final element, members, of the medium-term financial plan is a forecast revenue income and expenditure for the four-year period ending 28-29, and it has been developed based on the assumptions used in Jill's report in presenting the estimates for 24-25 this evening as a baseline. It is recognised that any future forecasts must also take account of spent and priorities, any future movements in the rate space, optimum level of reserves and utilisation of funds available, development prioritisation of capital plans and investment decisions. The key assumptions members in the forecast include continued central government support, reduced inflationary pressures, increased income generation from services, and an estimate of any agreed an annual pay award. There is no upward movement um, included within those forecasts on the rate base. Hence, the gap between increase in cost members, the financing of capital investment, and a relatively flat income position would result in a forecast of increased rates for future years. However, members, it's important to note these are forecasts only and will be revisited each year as part of the estimates and rate setting process. Just to note members that it was last year the Council approved a financial reserves policy, which I very much welcomed. It outlines the principles used to assess the adequacy of Council reserves, the use of reserves and associated reporting framework in compliance with legislation, guidance and codes of practice. Members' effective management of this policy is the Council's main approach to managing the current risks and ensuring financial sustainability in the medium term, with particular focus members on the Council's COVID reserve. The main purpose, which Jill has outlined, is to defray the continued 
financial burden arising from economic pressures. And noting again that that reserve has been utilised in tonight's position of £1 million. There is a balance then, members, in that reserve of £1 million. Therefore, effective management of this reserve, members, is one of the key approaches to managing the current risks and also to ensure financial sustainability in, in, in the medium term. So therefore, when that reserve is utilised, members, there is a need to review council strategy and policy linked to the delivery of discretionary services and to continually undertake efficiency reviews of statutory budgets over the short to medium term. The Council also has a contingency reserve which is available members to support unforeseen significant increases in service delivery of costs should they arise. The Estimates Working Group highlighted the need for developing sustainable budgets members that will meet Council priorities and in particular the need in the short to medium term to review strategy and policy linked to discretionary spend. This is likely to include members, but not um, conclusive, updated waste strategy, an estate strategy and people plan, and the determination of the optimum balance of service delivery linked to both revenue and capital plans, whilst taking account of climate change and longer term council priorities. The revenue forecast members has been developed to support council in its decision making and risk management in the event that any additional unexpected financial pressures may arise to, to support future policy and decision making and also to ensure that those decisions of future capital investment proposals that will be presented to each committee are in line with the objectives of the community and the corporate plan. Members, like uh, Jill, there are a number of recommendations within this report, but for the purposes, uh, Chair, of, of the stage we're at at the moment, um, the report is for noting, uh, subject to any queries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Catherine. Just at this juncture, you know, after <clears throat> hearing Jill and Catherine uh, uh, delivering their reports respectively, uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, both of you and your teams. And of course, this goes beyond your teams. This goes right across the full council uh, and all of the departments under the different directors to be able to uh, research the evidence base that's needed to be able to put these reports together along with our own input as members and to be able to deliver these reports. So uh, it is very much uh, uh, work that has taken months to be able to uh, get these papers and the delivery of them here tonight to help us uh, as we work through the months and the weeks of being able to set uh, and move towards setting a rate. Okay, so I'm going to bring Erlen. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to Jill, Catherine, and the full team at full team at Finance, and every other department and all the directors and heads of service right across the council. Uh, a lot of work has went into this, and uh, as I think was said at the outset, we've all had our party group meetings with you, uh, we've had individual meetings with you, and we've had the two workshops. Just uh, on behalf of the party, I'm happy to propose the recommendations as listed. Thank you, Chair. Well, we, thank you, Earl. And have I a seconder? They're just for noting here at this point. So, Debbie, you're happy to second. So we're just noting here this at this juncture in time. And now I'm going to ask Alison to, uh, we're moving to 3.3, and Alison is going to take us uh, through the statement on the robustness of the estimates and statement of adequacy of the reserves. Uh, thank you, Alison. Okay, Chair, thank you very much. And members, just to note this report to you is in my capacity as Chief Financial Officer. And as the Chair has indicated, there's really two components. And as a requirement of the Local Government Finance Act, I, I'm required to submit to you a report on the robustness of the estimates and the adequacy of any financial reserves for a financial year. So specifically for the financial year 24-25, and the detail is appended. So just really picking up on this builds on the presentations thus far, Chair, but on a few of the, the elements within the report. And maybe just to emphasise at the outset that, hence the name, this is about estimates. So we are taking our best assessment of the information available to us, considering all the variables, and based on that, 
We are making our recommendations to you, and uh, those assumptions, though, may change in the course of the year. In terms of the adequacy, excuse me, the adequacy of reserves is relevant in particular to the general fund reserve, and that relates to the delivery of normal council operations, and it's required to ensure the financial stability and security of the organisation. And formally, members, I acknowledge my responsibility to carry out the review of the robustness of estimates and the adequacy of the reserves as part of this process, and therefore just reporting to you this evening. In terms then of those assumptions, members, um, they're detailed in section one of the report, but they include everything from inflation rates and interest rates, employment costs, the variables around our operational costs, in particular utilities, as well as other fixed costs. We've highlighted in the report the particular uncertainties regarding waste costs, which remains a variable over the course of the year. And we've also set out the arrangements in terms of our expectations about operational service income and grant support. The central government support and our dependence on that has also been referenced in the earlier presentations. And maybe one of the other uh, hopes with the restoration of the assembly is that things like the rate support grant will perhaps be uh, reinstated and revalued to the previous levels uh, because it is an important leveling factor for poorer councils. We've also considered the rate space, the capital program, and have also considered the, the specific requirements of treasury man management guidance. I've also highlighted in this section, Chair, uh, as a risk, but it is a legitimate one, the ongoing risk of challenge arising from planning decisions, uh, and that could potentially result in both costs and compensation claims being awarded against the Council. So all of those elements have uh, featured in our considerations and are reflected in the budgets before you this evening. Um, as has been stated, the overall aim of the estimates is really to meet the legislative requirements to ensure that there's adequate funding in place to, through an agreed budget plan to support the Council in its delivery plans, whilst ensuring that an affordable district rate is charged to the ratepayer. And we are very mindful, members, of the uh, engagement throughout the process that you have reflected on the particularly challenging uh, financial times that this is for so many within the district, both from a, a domestic and a non-domestic perspective. Um, in terms of the opinion, then, Chair, which I set out in detail on pages five and six, uh, and as I noted at the outset, while the estimates process cannot provide entirely robust figures, uh, because there may be lack of appropriate evidence to support definitive estimation of costs and incomes. Uh, we have made those assumptions, which is a normal convention, and the assessment of the estimated outcomes have been made, and uh, these impact on the robustness of the estimates. However, notwithstanding that, and in reflection of all of the information presented thus far, members' guidance and support throughout, and the professional advice, I'm satisfied that the risks that impact on the financial stability of the Council have been fully and properly considered and that robust estimates have been made for the 24-25 financial year. Moving on then, Chair, to section three of the report, which is around the adequacy of the reserves. Um, as members will know, we do have a financial reserves policy in place and that outlines the general principles that we use to assess the adequacy and use of council reserves. And I know it's something that you're familiar with and we report to you on a regular basis. Um, in terms of the minimum prudent level of reserve that the council should maintain, I think it's important to be aware that this is a matter of judgment and there is no precise methodology for calculating the adequacy of reserves. It's the council safety net for unforeseen circumstances and must last the lifetime of the Council on unless contributions are made from the revenue budget. The minimum level cannot be judged merely against the current risks facing the Council, but must be regularly updated as these risks can and will change over time. In my opinion, I consider, in line with previous years, 8% of revenue income estimated at 55 million or 10% of the estimated total net expenditure budget, and that's net expenditure chargeable to the general fund, 44 million, to be an appropriate level for the Council's general fund reserve. Uh, as at the 31st of March of last year, 
the general fund reserve was just over four million pounds, the details included, and it's not anticipated that the level of revenue reserves will not have decreased by the 31st of March of this year. So then members, in arriving at the recommendation on the minimum prudent level of reserves, strategic operation and financial and economic risks have been taken into account, as has the robustness of the estimates information. The minimum general reserve will be kept under review and in the event that, that this reserve is or is likely to be inadequate, I'll report to the Council on the reasons for that situation and the action, if any, which I consider appropriate to take to prevent such a situation arising in relating to the corresponding reserve for the next financial year. I therefore recommend that the minimum general reserve balance should be set at 4.4 million. This is an increase of almost 100,000 on the balance as at the 31st of March 2023, which maintains the district fund at a level equating to 8% of revenue income or 10% of estimated total net expenditure. And then finally, Chair, and formally, in terms of my opinion, I am satisfied with the recommended minimum general fund reserve balance of 4.4 million. There is a need to maintain general contingency and resilience reserve to strengthen the midterm financial res resilience of the Council. There is also a need to consider capital reserves to provide a secure base to support the delivery of an ex expansive capital plan for the district over the medium to long term. And with that, Chair, I'd formally recommend that the Council approves a minimum general reserve balance of £4.4 .4 million. Pounds. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. And I'm looking for a proposal second for uh, that general reserve balance, £4.4 million. John Feely and Debbie, are we all agreed, members? Okay, thank you, members. Okay, brings us on to 4.1. Yes, Chair, thank you. So then the, the final report, and this really ties uh, all matters that we've considered uh, together, Chair. So in accordance with uh, part one of the Local Government Finance Act, and as laid down in the rates regulations, the Council is required before the prescribed date of the 15th of February this year to fix for 24-25 the amount estimated to be raised by means of rates. That includes both the non-domestic rate and the domestic rate, and these should be expressed in the terminology as detailed in paragraph 1-3 of the report. And just, Chair, before moving formally to the recommendation, just to add my thanks to that of colleagues for members' input to this process. I know it has been intensive and it's gone really since uh, over the summer, and I know a lot of effort has been put into it by elected members um, and not easy decisions have been taken. I appreciate that and also uh, by our own team as well. So I will just state the formal recommendations, Chair, that the Council approves the Council's medium term financial plan 2024-25, approves the minimum revenue provision policy statement for 24-25, the Treasury Management Statement 24-25, the Prudential and Treasury Indicators 2425 and the Capital Strategy Report 2425. That the Council authorise an affordable borrowing limit of 3.5 million for 2425, approves a minimum general reserve balance of 4.4 million for 2425, adopts the estimates of 2425 as set out in Appendix 1A and Appendix 1B of Paper A and authorises the expenditure shown in the detailed estimate schedules, authorises the expenditure and transfers to and from reserves as set out in paper A, and finally strikes a district rate for 24-25 for the Fermanagh and Oma District Council as follows, a non-domestic rate of 25.5700 pence in the pound and a domestic rate of 0.4223 pence in the pound. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison. And I'm looking for proposer and seconder. Marty, proposing. And Nolene Seckman. Have we all agreed, Mim? Uh, thank you, Chair. Firstly, I'd just like to thank the officers and their team for their efforts and engagement. Uh, throughout the process, we have, as a group, expressed some concerns over the proposed rates figures. And as such, notwithstanding the work of 
the team, the SDLP, will be voting against this race race. We still remain in an extreme cost of living crisis, as has been referenced tonight, and there appears to be no end or relief in sight for normal working people. Last year, this council increased rates by a record-breaking figure for the district. We realistically cannot continue to hike rates indefinitely by significant figures as proposed tonight. This will inflict yet more cost on the people and for what? You know, we had a discussion earlier this week on Tuesday about our inability to correct, collect waste even correctly. How are we meant to go to the people and ask for more money when we are failing in even collecting the bins every week? What many would see as our main function. Further to this, we have seen uh, a determination by Stormont departments to cut money and support to local councils, such as animal welfare budgets, which have been mentioned previously. Fundamentally, we believe that as a council, until these issues are resolved, we should not be inflicting rises on the public, while Stormont departments abandon their responsibilities on this. And the rate support grant, as has been referenced, has been slashed and cut nearly year on year, with no end in sight to that. And until the new finance minister reforms public expenditure and restores the rate support grant, which hopefully they will, to an acceptable level, again, we should not be looking at a rates hike at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Victor? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, obviously, during the, the estimate meetings, uh, the UUP made it clear that we wanted to keep any increase to a minimum. It's incumbent of us as councillors to do what is right for our residents and collectively save what we can at present to, and whatever we can save, we can present to the officers for implementation. Um, I'm sitting here looking at a table um, which was earlier given the, the percentage rates um, of 77% of our uh, income goes towards 77% goes towards staff. That is far and away the highest of the whole 11 councils in Northern Ireland, the lowest being 44%. We have to, we have to look at this. In the last nine years, rates have increased in this area by 59%. RPA, Review of Public Administrations, said there would be 570 million pounds of savings across the 11 council areas. We as a party raised major concerns at the time, but unfortunately, as a lot of cases, it fell upon deaf ears. For Mananoma District Council, uh, since the amalgamation, now employ 20% more staff than it did prior to the amalgamation. So again, that figure speaks for itself. So we will not be supporting the increase of the rates as put before us tonight. Chair, thank you. Okay. Mark? Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much to Jill and Catherine and the team for preparing the estimates for this stage. An awful lot of work goes into that, so um, thank you on behalf of all of us. Chair, really, and this is a point I've raised before several times, both with officers and in other forums as well, I am concerned, I am very, very concerned about the trajectory this council is on in terms of expenditure. I mean, we look, and in fact, Councillor Warrington has just explained very well about the hook we now find ourselves on in terms of so much of this council's revenue budget is going towards salary and wage costs far and above beyond the Northern Ireland average, and that is to the detriment of services. So it's a broader point, and it's, I know I'm reiterating the point, but I just want to make the point again tonight, because it's an important meeting, this council is on an unsustainable trajectory, and it will require tough decisions, but I don't see those tough decisions included in these rates tonight. And the officers in the top table will know broadly what I mean by tough decisions in terms of addressing that issue within this, the salary and the wage bill. Moving on, Chair. There's one, I mean, I have lots of concerns, to be completely honest, with lots of our many elements of the, the rates process. But one piece that I'm particularly concerned about tonight is, and again, it's, a, it's an issue I've raised on several occasions before, but it's about the five-year capital plan. And I know tonight is 
primarily focusing at the next 12 months, but the five-year capital plan is an important part of that. And whenever I look at that plan, yes, I see a very ambitious plan, but I see an unaffordable plan because whilst we're spending over 100, and, I think it's 118 million around that figure um, on capital, of that, over 38 million, I think it's 38.2 million of that is borrowing. And when I talk about, when we talk about external borrowing, that is borrowing, going out to the banks like any household has to go out and borrow for a car loan or a mortgage. Borrowing costs money. And whenever I ask the officials, and there's one project in particular, it's, and it's the Lakeland Forum, and many members in here will, re will remember or re will recall that our group and have raised concerns, not about the Forum project, because I think we're, there's unanimity amongst the council members that we want to see the Forum redeveloped, but to the absolute extent that it is, it is costing an absolute fortune. And whenever I look at the Forum, of that 38 million, 24 million of that is for the forum alone. And yet, whenever I spoke to officers a number of weeks ago in one of the briefing sessions, and I asked about what is the cost of the borrowing, yes, we will have to pay back that 24 million, but obviously you have to pay interest on top of that. And the figure was, at that stage, and I appreciate interest rates will change and borrowing costs will change day in and day out, but the figure of borrowing that was 15.4 million on top of the 24 million. That is an enormous cost and frankly, an unaffordable cost for an organization our size, for a council our size. And realistically, I appreciate it won't hit the impact, the, it won't impact the ratepayers' pocket this year or next year. Three minutes, sir. It, it, will, it will impact later. And in a number of years' time, we in this council are going to be looking at ourselves and we are going to be left with no choice. If we proceed at the, as proposed, we will be forced with no choice but to add significant increases to the race bills. Chair, there's lots of other points I'd like to say, raise about the inadequate, inadequacy of waste management and the challenges in terms Mark, of that, but I appreciate well you time. giving me flexibility. Thank you. Thank you. Josephine? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, again, at the outset, I want to uh, record uh, my thanks to the Chief Executive, to uh, Jill and Catherine and their teams for all the work that they have done in preparing uh, these estimate reports. Um, we have had uh, uh, workshops and extensive engagement. And uh, I, I, I firmly believe that everything uh, that uh, could reasonably be done has been done uh, to keep our uh, rate increase uh, to as low a level as possible. I'm not for one moment dismissing uh, the concerns uh, that have been expressed uh, by the SDLP and Ulster Unionist Party regarding uh, the potential impact on our ratepayers. We are acutely aware of the cost of living crisis and the difficulty uh, that our constituents have in paying the rates and the impact on our business community. But I think that we have to live in the real world and we have to acknowledge that we are living through an exceptional period of stress. We are facing a perfect storm emerging out of COVID. World geopolitics over which we have no control have had impact on inflationary costs, energy, building costs, insurance. We discussed this in council uh, the other evening. And uh, we want, we flatter ourselves quite rightly that we are fair employers and we do want to pay our staff uh, 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 an appropriate salary for their commitment to this organisation. We do have an ambitious capital plan. And uh, over the course of the negotiations, I have been asking whether any part of the capital plan can be postponed. Uh, but I believe that what we have agreed now is appropriate. Um, our constituents will want to see our district progress and grow, and to provide high quality public services delivered in uh, facilities that are fit for purpose. Um, it is not an ideal situation to be increasing the rates by any amount, uh, but if we are to qu square the circle and not lay, lay out uh, additional pressures for ourselves as a council in the future, then we have to accept uh, that some rise in the rates is unavoidable, and I want to support uh, uh, 
the proposed uh, estimates. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. And I suppose from 7 p.m. until just a few minutes ago, we heard a very comprehensive report, reports from the top table. And these reports are the culmination of, of many months of work, which, we all, which we've all been involved in. We've all had discussions around the table. We've all had our priorities heard. And a, a lot of work has been done. A, I've just got a quick question for, for Councillor Gannon and, and Councillor Warrington. You know, Councillor Gannon is against this rates raise, and, and Victor Warrington, Councillor Warrington, is not supporting this raise. Well, I have a simple question for the two guys. I'm willing to sit for another hour and hear their plan and hear their costings, but no rate raise or no increase will have an impact on our community services. It will have an impact on jobs. So I'm interested to hear what the MGA's proposals are and maintaining sort of what we have without impacting them services. So, you know, we're all ears. I'm happy to listen to them. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, I'm not uh, seeing any indication of Mark. Appreciate you've already let me speak on this. So this is more a question rather than a comment. But during the, the process to getting us to this stage, I'd ask for a number of options to be developed in terms of an option to be prepared and presented to members that would see the council taking on the maintenance of key urban infrastructure, the likes of the maintenance of the round, roundabouts in Enniskill and Nanoma, as well as options that would allow us to proceed with even the likes of the Halloween Halloween or the Halloween fireworks display in, in October this year. I don't, I don't see that, if, if I could just get a response on that. Okay. Hello. Sure. Okay. okay, so Chair, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll just comment on a, a couple of the, and then I'll answer the, the specifics in the latter uh, question. So I think firstly, and while um, possibly not intended, I, I wouldn't obviously agree with, with some of the commentary and certainly wouldn't agree with uh, criticisms around our frontline service delivery. Um, and I, I know that that's um, perhaps not, not the full intent of Councillor Gannon's uh, earlier words. Um, specifically, just if I may comment on a couple of um, Councillor Warrington's statements, and I know there was an opinion piece in today's paper where a number of similar comments were made. I don't think there was any effort made maybe to, to I know it is an opinion piece, but to fact check uh, some of the information included within it. But it's, it's not correct to say that the rates have risen 59%. I think what you've just done, or the author rather, has just taught it up sums. Um, similarly, there is a conflation around RPA savings and the operation of the council. Uh, it's fully on record that the local government sector disputed the business case on RPA. It did also have a 25-year payback period. I think we're coming into year 10. Um, in terms then of the, uh, the concerns that Councillor Robbins expressed earlier, Chair, regarding the financial traje trajectory of the organisation. Um, and I appreciate different views have been expressed on this, but certainly uh, we are satisfied that all of the recommendations before you, a mindful uh, commentary has passed on a decision that you haven't yet taken, but will come before members in the context of a full business case. I don't think it's correct to say we're on a, a difficult or dangerous financial tra trajectory. We are a well-governed, robust organisation. We have the sufficient financial capacity to do what's being recommended. Um, then the latter two points, and maybe just to say a little about the estimates process. Um, we, as I, I mentioned, so from early summer, some of the parties, and I welcome that, have been engaging very meaningfully in the process. I'd respectfully suggest the, the opportunity for coming forward with options around new service delivery is not the night when we're striking, striking the rate, but potentially there'd be cooperation in the next for the next estimates. In terms of the specifics around the fireworks, and Councillor uh, Ovens may be aware, we did actually report on this. There is additional financial provision in events, and it will be up to the event strategy working group to determine where that money goes. I believe that was covered at the second estimates workshop provided from feedback from, from other members. And the, the final comment I would make, Chair, regarding the urban infrastructure. So that's an additional service for, for infrastructure we don't own, 
that the council had already agreed we wouldn't maintain. I have nothing further to add. Okay, thanks, Alison. Victor, conscious that you were in. So. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously, we were asked to to, to justify our decision, um, and I think it was summed up. You know, we all contributed to the estimate workshops as they went forward and went on, uh, and we clearly during those. Uh, raised several concerns and probably one of the concerns that were raised and I've highlighted it tonight by giving you the percentages is the our staff co staffing costs um, were the highest of the 11 councils in Northern Ireland. Uh, our party has been highlighting this for quite a while we're now. I'm not going to give you the opportunity to re sort of state what you've already stated so well uh, hey, unless you have something new to add to this. No, if not, I, I'm basically saying uh, the councillor asked what we we could reduce the costs. Um, I'm I'm sorry. We better respect, yeah. please. I I I am given an answer to what the uh, items that we highlighted uh, during our our estimates workshops, on which we, as a party, made very clear uh, throughout the estimates, and uh, I can remember the final night. Uh, which we which we had the the meeting, um, I made it clear that we wouldn't be happy with the rate that had been agreed that night. Um, there was a meeting the next day. It was very short notice. It didn't suit everybody to attend it, uh, and we didn't have a chance for our members to to collate and come up with suggestions. Uh, thank you. Mark, you're not getting in again. You've been in twice. Uh, Adam, very you, I'm conscious briefly. also that you have been in. So, so just very briefly, Chair, uh, we attended all the estimates workshops and, com and communicated with the Chief Executive our concerns and said them in the estimates workshops for those who were there would have would have heard them. Um, just to request at this stage a recorded vote on that proposal, Chair. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you. John. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just firstly, I'd like to, on behalf of the Sinn Féin party, thank all the uh, council workers and officials that have worked on this. I'd also like to thank all the councillors who have partake, partaken in the it's, estimates workshops and process. It's long, arduous, and it's took many months. And I would, what my council colleague asked for proposals of how we get it down, what cuts we're going to make. And, some councillors came in and they said that they've highlighted concerns. We've all highlighted concerns. We've all highlighted particular concerns. That's not the question we asked, in fairness. We asked, have they any concrete proposals to get this rates down? And they don't. Um, so I, one of the concerns is, is, of course, the wage bill as well. A budget of 44 million and it's 32 million, it, it's massive. And that does leave a very high percentage. Can I just ask one quick, quick question? Our revenue budget is around 44 million. They're saying ours is the highest percentage. But on the scale of the 11 councils, that revenue budget, would that be near the top or would it be at the bottom? Sorry, Chair, thank you. It would be towards... The lower end, um, I think, and I haven't now had access to the figures that Councillor Warrington quoted, but I think it's important to note in the context of how codings and salaries, so I have not seen that information. I do know, and it has been routinely reported, that our salary bill would be higher. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. And I also think actually in, in the reports, reference is made to the need for a consideration of appropriate service delivery models against council priorities. But to answer your question directly, Councillor Feely, uh, we would certainly have a lower budget generally and up a lower proportion of our budget would be revenue and a less capacity to raise income, which is why things such as the rate support grant are critically important to an organisation such as ours. Uh, thank you. As Mark Twain said there's three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So when you say we have the highest wage, that, that probably is true, Bill, that is true. But you you are comparing it to places like Darien Savan that have a revenue of 60 or 80 million, I may be, Belfast 120 million. Mid Ulster is probably the only council close to us that has a revenue close to ours, and I'm sure 
their rate, their wages bill is on the upper end as well. Of course, when you have a mass, massive rates increase, we're, we're a large rural, rural constituency. It works against us. And as, as we have been raising these concerns for the past three, four months as well. Just, but just so where can I kind of request just a brief adjournment, if possible, for maybe five minutes to discuss this and then we'll come back. Is that OK? OK, you're proposing just need yeah. Second. Stephen, second. Okay. Yeah, 25. 25. 25. 25. 25. Okay, members, we're just going to reconvene at uh, 25. Stephen.
from ENTS. Okay, we'll carry on where we left off. Thank you all for that recess. So our next speaker is Diana. Chair, I'm happy to give way to Councillor Feely. Okay, thank you. That's okay, that's okay, thank you. Um, By magnanimous over you, John. Yeah, thank you. Chair, um, it, uh, first of all, the outset, I'd like to just recognise the amount of work, obviously, that has gone into this and thank uh, Alison, Jill and the team um, for um, the, the work you've done on this. It's, it's not an easy task by any means, and it is something that we're confronted with annually. Um, some of the councillors asked what we would do in terms of bringing down the rate. And I mean, there was an issue that I did raise in October 23, really around the Grange refurbishment project, um, questioning the value for money of having two contact centres along with civic centres. And I was advised that the Council's estate strategy um, is being reviewed at the moment. Now, we haven't actually seen it yet. It's for the to examine desk based requirements. Um, so, taking into account during COVID, um, we, our staff did operate hybridly, and it appears to be a model that many members are happy with. And so, in that regard, alongside the review of estates, I think it'd be useful to see a report brought back detailing staff numbers working hybridly, those signing into buildings over a spe specified period of time to demonstrate the exact usage of the buildings, the assets we have. Um, subject to that, and if we find, if Council finds that the accommodation can be, um, can be uh, rotated according to need on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I would propose, I think that that surplus assets could be sold off and the, those be put forward into the capital um, capital receipts to lower capital repayments and that is one 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 method of repayment that I think I think really we do need to look at our service delivery overall and um, take um, a measured step back and an overview to see how we are delivering services and it's also up to the councillors to to look at what we are recommending, um, bearing in mind the day-to-day -day running costs of the council to serve our community. Um, earlier uh, reference was made by Councillor um, Ovens um, surrounding number of options that we were seeking further advice and it hasn't just been landed tonight into this meeting because I know on behalf of our grouping, an email was sent on the 11th of January um, asking for a number of options to be prepared um, for the council to once again enter into an agreement with the DFI for the upkeep of some of the, uh, the areas discussed. So that, that email actually did go in advance to, to ask for a response to that. So it's just to put that on the record as well. But as just to demonstrate that we do have to look at means of reducing the overheads, the operating costs, and I propose to see, obviously not for tonight, but urgently going forward, this review of the estate strategy, the rationalization of estates, of assets, um, to determine where the savings can be made. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Diana. Just going to get Alison yeah, to- Yeah, no, ju just briefly, um, Chair, I think certainly Councillor Armstrong's comments regarding the need to consider priorities in the associated service delivery models is certainly the, the territory and it's referenced in the reports. I suppose just one practical point. So um, in terms of the utilisation of our buildings and certainly further detail on that can be brought, but exactly what you've said, sorry, Councillor Armstrong, when we identify surplus assets, they are disposed of and those become capital receipts. In the event, and I suppose sometimes there can be um, a conflation of budgets, but had the council decided not to proceed with the uh, Grange refurbishment, that would have been a capital as opposed to a revenue saving. Um, so, and, and just in terms of the email, yes, no, I was aware of the email. I suppose my point was we started the process in July. We had everything at, at, for final presentation for the 18th. So to come forward with a series of options on a decision the council had already taken regarding assets owned by a third party would be something that would require council decision as opposed to officers working up options contrary to a council position. Okay, thanks, Alison. Tommy? 
Thank you very much, Chair. I don't really know where to start. Uh, I remember the previous mandate I referred to some of the ongoings in the chamber as nonsense politics. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to have to refer to some of the shenanigans tonight as nonsense economics. I don't profess to be a pro professor or knowledgeable of economics, but I would be aware of fundamentally our wages bill is paid to our staff of approximately a thousand people in the district. Uh, I would also be aware that the 32 million that these people receive in wages is spent in the local shops. It's the, it's the backbone of our economy. Uh, it's just a pity our wages bill wasn't even higher, that we could guarantee people more employment. And I can't believe that the Ulster Unionist Party, in the day that's in it, when Inniskillen has just got the news of potential 300 redundancies in the BT, EE unit, that they would suggest that the rate that we are setting, which is coming in at a remarkably low figure, given the, the strictures that has been on the economics that this council has faced for the last two or three years, I, I have to commend the staff for coming in with such a low figure. Social media was uh, right this evening with uh, potential rate raises in other council areas of between 14 and 19 percent. And we have councillors here that are sitting saying we're paying too much in wages, which inevitably would lead to redundancies in our area. And uh, any knowledge of redundancies and how it works, it would cost this council millions upon millions to facilitate the redundancy packages for our workers. It's absolute nonsense economics. It's not the first time that those the Unionist Party has come in here with their zero rate increase nonsense. Nonsense politics, nonsense economics. As far as I'm concerned, it, uh, we have arrived at a very creditable figure, and I think it's one that our customers out there, our, our constituents, are fully aware of the pressures that are on the council to operate as a, a business model like any other private business out there. And the majority of the people that I speak to about rates understand that. But I wonder how the Ulster Unionist Party could sell it to the people and the workers that we have out there that their only proposal to reduce the rates even further is to do away with their jobs. Absolute nonsense and shameful politics, nonsense politics, nonsense economics. Guru Margaret Okay. Robert? Thanks very much indeed, uh, Chair. I apologise for being late. I was away doing something else. So I'm not going to enter into a rebuttal with regard to what transpired earlier this evening and which I wasn't a part of but I think um, part of what Councillor Maguire has said I'll, I'll have to rebut. I, I don't think the thrust from our party has ever been to actually create unemployment as such within the council. It's actually to relook at how we actually carry out and deliver our services through people for and on behalf of the council. There has been a tendency, I think, within this council, and it has grown over the last couple of mandates, to actually deliver everything in-house, and therefore we employ more staff in-house to do that. We can actually look at how we actually carry out and deliver that service without necessarily having staff within house. All the other councils do that type of model and that's why their relative wage bill, for want of a better word, is so much lower against their revenue resource on a yearly basis. It's not about creating redundancies and not doing the work. It's about having a fresh look at how the, the, the work is actually carried out. So I'll leave that there. And I think going forward, we as councillors have to bear a burden in, in that regard. It's not the officers. The officers are only enacting our wishes that we decide in this chamber. So I think we have to look at ourselves and say, do we want to do a fresh way of operating and working and maybe free up some of our revenue resource to do something else rather than the way that we're actually doing it? Because this past year, with regard to the way COVID and the cost of living has impacted every part of life, both public and private, with regard to the substantial rise in salary bills, has hit us substantially well. 
And the only way that we have been cushioned by that is by the frugal approach that we have taken over the last number of years through uh, our, the good auspices of our officers in building up substantial reserves. But those reserves have now become depleted and we are embarking on an ambitious capital programme that is already being impacted by the lack of resources that we have to actually fund that. And we are looking at additional costs going forward. So we actually need to look at this more seriously. Not necessarily now, but I think in the incoming year and just see how we're going to do it. I'll leave it like that because this is really a discussion that needs to take place after this and moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Jim. Uh, thank you, Chair. I fundamentally uh, disagree with Robert there and all the uh, Ulster unionists who have come in. Uh, Robert says this is a discussion that needs to take place after. No, it was a discussion that needed to take place from June uh, last year to now. I believe that's the format. This, the night's the night for the decision, not for a st the start of a discussion. Uh, I remember the Ulster Unionists and the Tory party having a, an electoral pact that called themselves the Yukons or, or some such thing. Uh, well, tonight they're definitely going down the Yukons or whatever that phrase was, route. Uh, they're, they're Thatcherism at its worst. Uh, privatized, <coughs> sorry, privatized services is what I hear. Uh, uh, pay off workers, put people out of the dole. And as Tommy said, 300 uh, uh, workers today on the threat, and the best those the unionists can come up with is threatening council staff with unemployment. And the SDLP sitting over there saying nothing, when they were asked for what was their proposal, they said that they had put them to, to, in the workshops. Well, I didn't hear them. Maybe they could enlighten us on, on the proposals uh, again. Maybe, the, uh, maybe they'd be fit to do that. But stud politics at its worst now from the Yukons. Okay. John, and thank you for uh, letting me back in again. Firstly, uh, Councillor Armstrong's proposal of uh, looking at hybrid working, brilliant. But even if we were, we do understand the 15th of February, we have to set this rate by. So making the proposal tonight, it's not even, it's not going to come back by next Thursday, but I thank you at least for was one positive thing and we'll be supporting you when you bring that to one of the committees and we'll be setting it for you and we'll see how it goes. But I do understand Councillor McCann made a put you under pressure by asking us to things that we can actually cut tonight by next Thursday because you didn't bother fully taking part in the process earlier. But if either the SDLP or the UUP want to propose we put this off until Monday night, you should come back with cuts that can be made and implemented before the 15th, we're more than happy to support you. Otherwise, if you, if you don't make that proposal, we'll be going to a vote tonight. So, balls in your court, and after that, we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to have to do growing up politics. Okay, I'm just going to bring Alison in at this point. No, th thank you, Chair. It's really just on um, a point of maybe practicality, following on from Councillor Feely's comments. So, um, to get to, well, whatever the level of reductions, but 1% in the rates is equivalent to £400,000. But the key thing is all of these reports are linked, so everything has to be reworked. So it's not as simple, respectfully, as coming in and saying, this is where we're going to cut, because all of the schedules have to be replaced. So that is not, I would say, from an officer perspective, a feasible consideration. OK, thanks, Alison. Harry? Just a question, uh, Chair. Um, last year, of the 11 councils in the north, I think that the rates we struck was either the lowest of the 11 or the second lowest. It was definitely one of those two. Are we on course again 
to be one of the lowest in the north of the 11 councils. Yes, Chair, based on the information that I've seen and what's in the public domain, yes, that would be correct. Okay. Josephine, conscious uh, that... Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for allowing me to come in again. Nothing that I have heard uh, in the debate in the Chamber this evening, uh, Chair, has made me uh, um, change my mind uh, regarding accepting uh, the Recommendation 7 of this report in, in its entirety. Uh, the one point that Councillor Gannon made uh, that I wish to support publicly is, um, you know, the input from central government in terms of our funding, and other members have referenced this as well. Um, I think there has to be a recognition by central government that local government needs financial support to help us deliver our services in very challenging situations and particularly considering climate change and the um, uh, amendments that we have had to make to our properties and vehicles and so on. Uh, so, you know, um, there, there is a, a necessity for um, uh, this all to be looked at again, the rate support grant. We have long considered, Chair, that the uh, transfer of functions grant uh, has been inadequate to make, meet our demands. And if the partnership panel gets up and running again, which I hope it does, perhaps this is something that could be brought back to the panel at a, at a, at a later date and strong representations made uh, to, to look at this and redress the imbalance. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any other speakers, so I have a proposal and I'm minded to go to that proposal that was proposed uh, by John and seconded by Debbie, uh, that we do strike the rate as uh, outlined. Okay, so where did I get the other one? Was it? So who? Okay, so we're going to revise what I just said there. So Marty uh, proposed and uh, Nolene seconded and that was a request from Adam. I'm correct in saying a recorded vote. So if we want to uh, set that vote, Donald. Or it's, act it's actually Heather gets the, the machinery in action. And unfortunately, you can't vote. Mm -hmm. Where can you not vote? Just to speak. Well, I just can't change this. You know, it's those weird things. Things are normal. Let's see, does our figures come up this time? No, you can't do it to vote over. Sure, vote placed, that's it. Sure, vote placed, that's it. How do you change? So, just, what have we got in a number? It's is. I, I, I know it's not easy to read that, but we can't get used to it. So, that's nine, no one's 10, 14, 15, 16, and yet it's 24. Is that right? 24 to 249. No? What does that? I do this 25 plus 1 is 25. 25 to 9. And I'm staying. Yes. 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 
And that's what I had, so yeah, yeah. Okay, members, uh, the vote was 25 in favour, nine against, no abstaining. So uh, that vote is carried. Okay, and we have no correspondence. We do, we have one. Sorry, Chair, we just have one item of correspondence and uh, it came th t today. Uh, it's in the other folder and there's um, a time sensitivity. So. Members will be aware that sorry, it relates to lands at Kalartri Road, Brookborough, and the Council has previously given a letter of support for a community organisation to proceed with their uh, interest in DFI-owned property. This is a, a letter for a similar request from another organisation, so it's the Elam Church, and they would also wish to express interest uh, in, in the facility, and they set out their proposals on the site. Not a request for funding of any kind, Chair, um, but there's nothing to prevent the Council from issuing a second letter uh, of support. It's property owned by a third party, um, and we, we can, with member support, we can issue that accordingly. Okay, thanks, Alison. Victor? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I obviously was one of the councillors who had been contacted about this, and uh, I would like to propose that we send a letter of support uh, on behalf of the Elam Church. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Victor. Seamus? Thank you, Chair. Um, was the original uh, request uh, not to ask us to uh, sponsor their, uh, the Cross Community Group uh, to be sponsors uh, for their? No, no, Chair. It was just simply a letter of support for their application to the Department, and we had no, no further role. And how, how can we send a letter of support to two, uh, for two uh, organisations? How, how would that work now? I'm, I'm confused in that. Okay. It wouldn't be that, un well, it wouldn't be that unusual, Chair, in that quite frequently we would receive requests for groups from across the district applying, for example, for funding to the same fund, uh, and the Council would regularly give letters of support. Um, so it, it wouldn't conflict, and we made no provision uh, or nor were we requested by the group in the original letter that it would be exclusive support for the, the first interest that came through. Um, well, I would, uh, the Development Association is the only cross community group that I know of that's in Broughtborough. It is the only neutral space that's in Broughtborough. So I would uh, uh, suggest or propose that, that they are the group that uh, we support. Uh, I, like, this is a church group that has come in. I know they're doing great work. Uh, there's, there's four or five other churches in Broughtborough. Uh, if they all come in looking for support to buy it, do we give letters of support to them all? This is uh, uh, the cross community group, the Broughtborough Development Association is long and I think Victor will confirm this is long uh, being the cross community group in Broughtborough and I would be uh, suggesting that we support them. I think to be putting out a uh, lot of support in numerous groups just uh, we may as well not do it at all. Uh, it, it, it sounds like a, a bit of a, it just doesn't sound right. Like what, what would be the point in that? We've been safe for doing none. I suppose just chair to, on one point of clarity to confirm we have issued the letter of support for the community organisation, so that's already gone. Okay, Robert. Thanks, thanks, chair. Thanks, Tom. Uh, no, I was um, approached as well by Nathan Johnson uh, in regard to some of the issues surrounding that, and I did I think get in touch with Jill, and then it went on to John News. I'm very happy. I mean, the, the background basically is they're doing great outreach work right across 
the community in Brookborough. Uh, they have a very big youth organization. They are self-funded and part of their thrust is they're not looking for any financial support at all, uh, both in the capital works or the revenue going forward. And they have quite an extensive program that we could be providing. So I don't see why we as a council can't support them alongside the community group. Um, we shouldn't be actually trying to say one is bipartisan and the other is a uh, single issue or single faith. If we go down that road, councillors, we are really drawing a line and saying that we are becoming sectarian. We are open in this chamber. So I second Councillor Warrington's proposal that we should, as a council, give them another letter of support. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Okay, thanks, Robert. Seamus, can't you ship in? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, 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 that's just an unbelievable comment from Robert, Robert there. The, it, I am literally saying that we, we support the one and only cross community group that's in Brookburg. And he's saying that it'd be sectarian then to support a one uh, faith uh, group. <laughs> it's, it, it's laughable, you know. Uh, uh, so. Victor? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I disagree with Councillor Green. There's actually a cross community uh, women's group in Brookborough as well, uh, which I know I assisted uh, when they put their application in for a Christmas tree. Um, also, um, I think it would be worthwhile reading the 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 email which came in from uh, the the uh, Elam Church. Um, they're not looking for money. They're not looking for any financial support. I think they've everything in place and they've quite uh, an exciting, uh, they've quite an exciting project there. Whereas, uh, great if the community group. Uh, can do something similar, but they are going to be dependent on getting grants and raising the funds where the funds are already in place with the other organisations. So I would be very disappointed if we can't agree to send this letter uh, tonight. Thank you. Okay. Paul? Just thanks, Chair. I wasn't going to speak on this, but the Elam Church is very cross community at the same time. They do a dinner there every week. And it's open to the doors, open to anybody going in for the dinner, no matter who they are. And they're not looking for money for this. They're going to fund it themselves, where the community group will be looking for funds and grants to do what they're going to do. And I think we can support both groups at the same time. Okay, Paul. Eddie? Thanks, Chair. I, I would echo that statement. I think that both both can be supported in terms of, of their, uh, their, their bids. Uh, and, and the decision can be made at the, at the end of that uh, by, by, the, by the parties who make the, the, the decision. It, it's, it's for us to suggest that both are worthwhile uh, causes, both are worthwhile uh, in, in the community, and they, they offer some, some, uh, some good solutions for the community. It's a community that, that as, as the people from Brookborough will know, would, would avail of a, of a hub like this, uh, and it would be of good benefit to everybody. So um, I, I see no reason why we can't send a letter out in support for this. Thank you. Yeah, and it, Josephine? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, well, I have to say, on reading the email from uh, the Elam Church, um, you know, what they're proposing to do is really very impressive. And I think it will deliver considerable benefits to the community. As a council, we are not making the decision. Uh, we are only you know, affirming that this that their, their their bid seems to us to be reasonable and worthwhile. And for that reason, I think uh, we should uh, send the letter of support, Chair. Thank you. Okay. I have no other speakers, and I have the one proposal here proposed by Victor and seconded by Robert uh, that we should issue the second letter as, as requested. Uh, so are we all agreed? Uh, dissent from that decision because I think it's a it's a uh, to send a letter of support for two groups with one project is completely uh, uh, t taken away the fa uh, the the actual thing of a writing a letter of support like if those ten groups in they were write it for ten of them it makes no sense okay Shivas. 
Okay, members, that's passed. And uh, that moves us to any other relevant business. And the only bit of relevant business is I have Dermot uh, that just wishes to uh, address us. Thanks, Chair, for letting me bring this bit of business to the Chamber. This afternoon, BT announced that it is considering clo closing its Enniskillen office, putting at risk 300 jobs. This, this, they claim this is because the office building is not fit for purpose. This is a shocking and deeply concerning announcement by BT. Tonight, as we sit here, 300 workers in our community will be afraid of what this announcement will mean for them and their families. BT is one of the largest employers in the wider Fermanagh area and for many years has provided jobs and opportunities to so many in our community. It is a shameful that they are now considering turning their backs on the community here. A small rural county like Fermanagh will be absolutely devastated by the, the job losses of this magnitude. BT have serious questions to answer about this and one of the questions that I would ask them is what consideration did they give to the impact that this 300 job loss would have on Inniskillen and the wider Fermanagh area. Sinn Féin MLA Gemma Dolan has requested an urgent meeting with BT so they can explain this announcement and as a council we must do everything that we can to support the affected workers and we should ask and we should demand that BT protect these jobs. So I am proposing, Chair, that we also seek an urgent meeting with BT so we can ask them to explain this announcement and to directly relay to them the serious concerns that we have. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Dermot. Anne? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to agree with everything Councillor Brown said there and second his proposal. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Marty? Now, just to come in, uh, at the start of the meeting, uh, John had mentioned about councillors who couldn't make it here tonight because of the adverse weather. So, and it was talked about bringing it up at PNR. So, when I understand the exception of localised or regional weather conditions, I think that people should be allowed to uh, go hybrid to, to facilitate them if that's the case. But there's also another situation that for someone, uh, for say, shh, to maternity. Please, or, people, it's really hard. Chair, for someone who is uh, on maternity or paternity leave or incapacitated due to injury or illness, that, that the same condition should be made that they'd be able to attend uh, the meeting virtually as well. Okay. Alison, did you want to just... Yes, sorry, Chair. I'll, I'll just, yep, no, certainly. Um, so, Chair, we have revised the standing orders. Uh, now, maybe just the latter point that Councillor McColgan has referenced, there certainly is in provision. And maybe just to say very briefly, uh, the Council, in its previous considerations, both in the last mandate but also in this mandate, were very keen that the Council meetings would remain fully in, in person. Uh, but we have provision for a uh, hybrid at all of the other meetings. So the specifically around the uh, amendment that we made to standing orders, it was around extreme weather uh, where they would and would move fully virtual rather than hybrid. So I suppose it would just be if, if there was a desire that we would include an additional paragraph chair to allow for hybrid attendance. And the I suppose the severity of the weather was linked to extreme circumstances, which really was accompanied by a not to travel warning. I, I'm not disputing the circumstances I know in Midtrone this evening were challenging, um, So, but it, it probably didn't meet the test as we had described it in the standing orders. So if, if members wish, Chair, it, it won't be revisiting your decision. It's, it would essentially be a, a, probably an additional paragraph or an additional clause to the standing orders to reflect uh, the circumstances that have been outlined. As I say, we're okay, certainly for a committee, for all, for all of the circumstances Councillor McCulgan listed, but not definitely not for the Council. So that would be the only direction we'd need if, if there's consensus around that. Okay, all right. Yeah, and, and Chair, I, I agree. I, I prefer the full attendance at the Council meeting as well, but I just think in those circumstances, and tonight, 
an exception where Midtown was probably worse than a lot of other areas. I mean, I travelled from Armagh here and, and had no problem, but I, I did see the photos of the roads there. And perhaps people had concerns, not just to come in here, but getting back again if the weather conditions worsened out due to the, the weather warning. But yeah, I'm happy to go with that. To propose the, uh, de uh, yeah. the addition of the uh, paragraph in there. Okay, thanks, Marnie. Keith? Thank you, Chair. It's just to uh, commend to support uh, what Councillor Brown had said with regard to a uh, meeting BT. Um, obviously, that's it's going to have a big impact on uh, on a lot of people, and I'd say we all know somebody that works on BT. But it's not that long ago, a number of years ago, where I think there were BT was actually maybe bragging that that's one of the lo uh, the most lo loyal workforce in Fermanagh. Like there's 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 people there with thirty, a lot of people with up and thirty years experience, and 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 employment with them and it'd be just a shame you know sort of thing for for, for us to be looking at 300 day redundancies and it's at any time of the year so i just uh, like to support uh, councillor brown and what he has said thank you yeah thanks keith eddie thanks chair and uh, yeah i echo uh, the previous councillors um and, and what they've said so far um could i ask if we could add to the request to arrange a, a meeting with invest ni um, part of the the explanation from BT was the uh, the poor standard of, of location there. Could we maybe uh, arrange in a, a meeting with InvestNI to discuss an alternative location within the Inniskillen area that could be facilitated um, to the standard and specification that BT we require? Um, I would like I'd like at least to remove that argument from their from their plinth because uh, this would be devastating uh, to the people of Inniskillen. Uh, I like a lot of people will have family have family working for BT, uh, and and it's a substantial employer of of relatively well paid jobs in, in the town, and uh, it goes a long way to improving uh, the lives of of people in in the area. So I would ask if we could add that, please. Thank you. Okay, Dermot, are you content that we would follow that? And Anthony, you're content. Okay. Uh, Robert? Yeah, just very quickly, um, I would agree with everything that all the other councillors said. Uh, the loss of any job is obviously bad, both to the person that's losing the job, but to the community that they serve and the, the whole wider family. And I think it's a lame excuse from BT that, that they can't actually input the capital to actually upgrade and do whatever. They have a very highly trained core staff in there. And I think as an employer, they probably realise to re-employ another quartile of staff somewhere else is probably going to cost them as much as it would to actually refurb the thing. So I think what we as a council need to put forward to them is to look at their proper options and see what way they have done it and try and get them to see that they need to invest reinvest as well in the works in the workforce and if that means an upgrade in the infrastructure they should do that so our support is wholehearted in uh, behind the workers thank you chair okay so i'm going to take that proposal by dermot and seconded by anthony are we all agreed and with the inclusion uh, as suggested by eddie okay and have i got a seconder for marty's proposal that we uh, Stephen, so are we all agreed that that uh, extra paragraph would be included? Agreed? Okay, members, thank you very much. That uh, concludes our business for tonight. And stay at home.